Our next presenter will be Harry Cherkin. Um, he's a partner in the law firm of Drinker, Biddle and Reith. He served as a managing partner and for 17 years as chair of its real estate group. He's a member of the advisory board and faculty member of the Advanced Commercial Leasing Institute at Georgetown University Law Center. And has served as visiting faculty member at Villanova University School of Law and a guest lecturer at the Wharton Real Estate Center of the University of Pennsylvania. Harry's a member of the American College of Real Estate Lawyers. His professional accomplishments have also been recognized by his inclusion in Chamber USA's leaders in their field for Pennsylvania real estate, in Best Lawyers in America for 10 successive years in the category of real estate, in Who's Who in the World, Who's Who in America, Who's Who in the East, Who's Who in American Law, Who's Who Legal U.S. Real Estate, the international who's who of real estate lawyers and the guide of the world's leading real estate lawyers. In his free time, Harry began pursuing a Master of Liberal Arts at Penn in January 2006 and was awarded his MLA this past week. His area of concentration has been a consideration of ethnicity through history and the arts. His capstone project, about which he will speak tonight, is Assimilation and Whiteness, a consideration of the United States versus Cartosian and its implications for the Armenian American community, which completed this spring and read by Professors Melvin Hammerberg, Anthropology Emeritus Professor at Penn, and Professor Peter Borlakian, who's at Colgate University. Um, Harry. Excuse me, as Chris mentioned, I did start my MLA studies uh, uh, four years ago. I would take uh, one course a semester while I continued to practice real estate law during the day. But I've always had a very strong interest in ethnicity and immigration, particularly during the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, with an emphasis on my own background as an Armenian American. The uh, wonderful thing about the MLA program is that it enabled me to explore questions uh, relating to this broad subject area of, eth of ethnicity and immigration from a number of different angles within the uh, uh, categories of arts and history. When it came time for me to pick my capstone project, I chose a subject which brought together a broader interest of mine in American history, questions of ethnicity, the Armenian immigration experience, and my own training as a lawyer. You see my topic uh, on the screen. Unfortunately, my topic doesn't lend itself to some of the wonderful graphics that uh, those who presented before me have, but. Uh, uh, perhaps I will be able to add some color through my words. I first learned about the key case of uh, United States versus Cartosian a few decades ago, and I recall at that time I was traveling through Portland, Oregon, and actually was so fascinated by it that I spent an afternoon in the Portland Public Libraries reading newspaper accounts of it because it captured the front page attention of the, the Portland press day after day. Let me put it, this case into context for you. The case was tried in 1924. That was a period in American history after World War I when nativist feelings were becoming paramount. There were also fears of the Red Scourge coming from east to west over Europe and then uh, across into the United States. I'm sure you're all familiar with the case of Sacco and Vanzetti. That's another example of the fears Americans had for all foreigners. At that time, a quota system was tightened as far as immigration is concerned in the United States. That quota system tilted very heavily towards those who came from northern and western European countries. It was skewed against those who came from Southern Europe or Eastern Europe, or what I'll call the Mediterranean Basin. To give you an example, in 1924, the number of Armenians who were permitted to become naturalized citizens was 124. It had been reduced to 124. In the United States in the 1920s, there were approximately 50 to 80,000 Armenians. So why the case? In the context of these fears, a man named Tatos Kartosian, who had come to the United States in 1909 and joined his brothers in business in Portland, Oregon, and who fulfilled all the requirements for uh, naturalization, petitioned for naturalization. The federal judge in Portland who heard his case and heard the government's arguments against his naturalization granted his petition 
knowing that the government was going to challenge it through a cancellation process. Perhaps you're curious as to what the government's argument was. Let's go back to the Founding Fathers. In 1790, the Founding Fathers of the United States, in their wisdom, known to them at the time, said that one could become a naturalized American if they were an alien, of course, free white person. Now, that stayed the law of the land until 1870. It was only modified to accommodate those of African descent after the country had ripped itself nearly apart and in Reconstruction, they realized that the emancipated slaves were entitled to citizenship, and with that covenant in, in our laws, they would be precluded. So that law was modified to include those of African descent. So in other words, until 1924, the laws were if you were a free white person or of African descent or nativity, you were entitled to naturalization. I'm not sure how many of you have any sense about the Armenians, but this is a people who primarily lived in what was then called the Ottoman Empire. The bulk of the Ottoman Empire was in what was then known as Asia Minor. It, in the wisdom of the naturalization officer in Portland, Oregon, it occurred to him that if an Armenian came from Asia Minor, therefore he must be Asian. If he's Asian, he therefore can't be white. If he can't be white, he should be denied citizenship. The Armenians, of course, were horrified by uh, this potential outcome. You might ask, what, is the, what would be the ramifications for, for that? Well, first of all, if you're not a citizen, you've lost your, your right to vote. If you're not a citizen, you have no right to a passport. At the time, there was a whole wave of alien land laws sweeping throughout the Western United States. What that meant is if you were not a citizen, you couldn't own land. So all Armenians who owned land ran the risk of having to sell their land at fire sale prices. Perhaps the greatest risk, however, is that the Armenians would have been forced to leave the United States, and they would have been forced to return to the Ottoman Empire. Again, in context, what is known by many as the Armenian Genocide had just ended when 1.5 million Armenians had been either murdered or deported in the Ottoman Empire. So the Armenians here, without passports, without an ability to travel, would have been sent back to the Ottoman Empire and for a fate probably no different than those of uh, who had perished before them. This turned out to be an 80-page paper. So, Chris, I'm not going to go through all, all 80 pages of it. But what, uh, uh, what I found most interesting about the journey is that I became a bit of a detective. This took me back to the National Archives in Seattle. And though the trial transcript, transcript had been reported to have been lost for 50 years, they finally uncovered it. And I was able to identify the nine witnesses who appeared for the defense. I found that one of the witnesses for the defense was a man who became known as the father of American anthropology, a man named Franz Boaz. And because of identifying Boaz as one of the witnesses, I was able to go to the American Philosophical Society right here in Philadelphia and find that all of Boaz's papers were here. And in Boaz's papers was a manila folder saying Cartesian case. And in the Cartesian case were letters that he had stamped confidential. And in those letters, copies of his own letters to a, an attorney named William Demarest Guthrie who was one of the leading attorneys in America at the time. And I should put in context again, the, the Armenian American community gathered nickels and dimes to defend Cartosian 
because the, the United States government said at the outset, whatever the outcome, we will appeal to the United States Supreme Court. So Guthrie was one of the greatest Supreme Court appellate attorneys in the country at the time. Boaz's letters to Guthrie and Boaz's letters to uh, a man named Paul Warburg of the, by the, I should also put in context, Franz Boaz was a German Jew. Warburg, Warburg came from the, the well-known German Jewish banking family. Boaz said, make no mistake about it. They're coming after the Armenians first because they're their easier mark. They're the first people to adopt Christianity as a state religion. They'll come after the Jews next. And so there is correspondence in Boaz's file between himself and Guthrie, between Guthrie and Lewis Marshall, one of the leaders of the American, one of the founders of the American Jewish Committee, alerting them to this risk. Uh, my, my, my journey took me for, to four days in the National Archives and finding these little tissue paper carbons that they used in the 20s of correspondence. Uh, I, I should, I, one little anecdote that I think you might uh, find interesting, a word of caution, whatever you send the government is kept. Every letter, every, everything you send in anger, in emotion or otherwise is kept. And for example, I found a letter from a man named William Schumann to the U.S. attorney who was prosecuting Cartesian. And William Schumann wrote the letter and said, you know, of course the Armenians shouldn't be entitled to become citizens in the United States. But the Armenians are a small group of people. And if you don't see the hand of the Jew all over their defense, you really are mistaken. So in any way I can possibly help, I stand at the ready. And he signed it, William Shulman, landscape ar architect in Portland. And one of the wonderful things today, compared to when I would do academic research 35 years ago, when I was last in school, is the internet. And so I was curious if I could ever find anything about Schumann. And I would Google and Google, and I finally almost gave up, and then his name appeared, sort of popped up, and it appeared in a listing of a series of telegrams that had been opened up under some, by someone else under a Freedom of Information Act. And they were telegrams from the head of the FBI Portland Division to J. Edgar Hoover on the night of well, midnight of December 8th, 1941. And it was under a heading called Japanese Detainees. Of course, I was completely puzzled. But then I kept reading and reading. Where, will I, where was I going to find Schumann's name? Well, I found Schumann's name in a report saying, we have arrested William Schumann tonight at midnight. Mr. Schumann, a leader of the German-American Bund in the United States, who has been supportive of, of the teachings of Adolf Hitler at, to his own admission since the early 1920s. So this is a man who obviously had uh, a particular bent on, on the subject of immigration. I might also add, I did a little further research and Schumann was not a naturalized citizen. So he was passing judgment on other people becoming naturalized. Um, I probably don't have much more time. Do I have a little more time? Okay, I, because I, I you may be interested to know how the case ended, but I, uh, I <laughs> but I'm standing here so maybe that's, <laughs> one clue as an Armenian American of, of how it ended. But um, the, um, the Armenian community put together a remarkable defense, hiring two of the leading lawyers in America, uh, a, a former Supreme Court justice of the Oregon State Supreme Court who 
happened to have gone to college and valedictorian of his class at Lafayette College right in Pennsylvania and had moved west. And as I mentioned, Mr. Guthrie, um, the uh, nine witnesses were fascinating, uh, a number of scholars. It was a little disturbing, frankly, for me to read that one of the arguments made, but I understand why it was made, was to show that the Armenians are viewed as white. So they, were, they had members of various fraternal organizations, such as the Odd Fellows and the Masons, and you can imagine. Uh, and they would all come and they would testify that, oh yes, we have many Armenian Americans in our organization. No, no, we don't have any blacks, don't worry about that. We don't have any Asians, but yeah, we have Armenians. And they would make that argument in, in a very almost, uh, almost uh, kind of, television drama way, one of the most interesting witnesses was a woman whose name was Mrs. Uh, Otis Floyd Lampson, had been the personal uh, tutor of the Rockefeller children, married to one of the leading physicians in Seattle. She was very fair-skinned, light-eyed, spoke seven languages, extremely well-dressed, and uh, she had been a, a leader in in Seattle society and head of various organizations, member of various exclusive clubs. And as you read the trial testimony, you can almost see the defense attorney step aside and then dramatically turn to her as you read his words. And he said, oh, by the way, Mrs. Lampson, what is your maiden name? And she said, my maiden name is Armina Tashchin. Tashchin, is that an Armenian name? Why, yes, it is. Well, ironically, if you read the court's opinion, he focused on intermarriage, he focused on Mrs. Lampson. As an aside, I tracked down Mrs. Lampson's 60-year-old granddaughter who got me remarkable information about her. Uh, how did the case end? The, the federal judge, Wolf, Wolverton, found that the Armenians were white, that the Armenians were entitled to um, citizenship in the United States uh, the question had been finally resolved. There were, as you can imagine, if there was a lot more give and take back and forth. Uh, but one little, almost humorous uh, note. I found Mr. Cartosian's 80-year-old granddaughter living in Fresno, California. And I uh, called her. And she was a sweet lady, and I said, do you know about this case? Oh, I remember hearing something about it. And I said, this was such an important case. I know, do you have any papers? Oh, no, we don't have any papers about it. And I said, well, another cousin told me to speak to you. Well, we really have nothing. And then about two weeks later, she, uh, she called me and said, you know, we found two letters in my mother's papers. I know it couldn't be anything terribly important, but do you mind if I fax them to you? And I said, no, I'd love to see them. And the one letter was from that Portland lawyer, the Lafayette trained fellow, who was the lead trial counsel, and it just simply said, dear Mr. Cartosian, here's a letter from William Guthrie in New York that I think you might find of interest. And then the, so I said, well, that's not very important, and then I read the second letter, and I, if I can just go to the very end of my paper here and, uh, and uh, read it, a portion of it to you. Uh, in it, Guthrie had written this gentleman and said, well, tell us once and for all, you've been threatening to appeal this case to the Supreme Court. Will you be appealing or not? Do we have to be prepared to mount a further defense? And this is a letter that was sent uh, December 7th, 1925. And the person who wrote the letter to Guthrie, again, the counsel in New York, saying, yes, this had always been considered to be a test case against uh, Armenians. And uh, he then advised, though it may have been the intention of the United States to, to take any decision rendered in the district court to the high court for final decision, both the Solicitor General and the Department of Labor, after reviewing the Cartosian decision of Judge Wolverton, have concluded that it was correct 
and that there was no prospect of obtaining a reversal in the Supreme Court and that the government had decided to change its plans based on the thorough and convincing presentation made by Guthrie and by the Armenian Defense Committee and concluded that the government will acquiesce fully in the finality of the decision. In all respects, the Armenians are entitled to naturalization in the United States. They can stay in America. And then the letter was signed, John D. Sargent, Attorney General of the United States. And for any of you who do any academic or any kind of exploit, even if you're just on eBay looking for that one thing, when I got that letter, and I just remember sitting there and smiling because I said, as I almost spoke to Cartosian, I said, yeah, this was the only letter worth keeping. All the other letters from your lawyers back and forth were all nice, but this was the Attorney General of the United States saying the Armenians won and that they could stay in America.